Hey everyone, thank you all so much again for tuning in to another episode of the Hue Capital Podcast with yours truly, Jalisa Juju Fontaine. So today I kind of have a special guest with you all. Her name is Mika Lejean. Um, I'm so excited to have her today because I actually found her on LinkedIn. Um, I think a couple of months ago, I was just really interested in learning more about Black and Latinx founders, right? With me kind of starting my own platform, Melinda Vision, and kind of re-inviting it into this world, right, in 2020, I just really wanted to know what were the experiences like for people who have been doing this founder thing for quite a little while? Um, and as I was watching her content and kind of getting a sense of who she is and what she's about, I was like, I'm inspired. <laughs> like if I feel inspired and now I have a platform where I can bring people like her on it, I feel like why would I not present this amazing person to you all? Uh, so once again, that's the reason why Mika is here. Uh, so as you all know, I am really big on bragging about my guests and I say this every single episode, I'm sorry, but here it is. So Mika Lejean is CEO and co-founder of Two Swim a social messaging app with an emphasis on close connections and private communities. Uh, real quick interjection, when I saw Two Swim, I thought she actually had like a swimming company. Like maybe it was like clothes, maybe it was like a pool, I don't know, I just, sorry y'all. <laughs> but that's not what it is. Um, a graduate of the New School, she holds a BS in liberal arts, completed the Rigia Honors Program for Writing and Democracy, and also holds a certificate in design management from Ryerson University. As a writer, educator, technologist, and STEAM advocate, Miko's work uses an intersectional lens to explore the relationships between tech, art, and social justice. As an organization nerd, she has consulted with tech and DTC startups, design studios, and education organizations on marketing, operations, community building, and more. She does a lot. <laughs> she has presented to audiences across North America, from Sotheby's to Loyola, Marymount University, to the CIARS Decolonizing Conference, and cause artists named her one of 37 social entrepreneurs to watch for in 2020. So I know I kind of read a lot to you all, but once again, I just really want you all to get a sense of what you're gonna expect throughout this episode. And once again, I'm gonna have my amazing guest, Mika, share more about her story. Thank Hello, you. Mika. Hi, that was okay. a, such a great, sweet intro. Thank you for that. <laughs> of course, of course. So tell us about yourself. Yeah, happily. So hi, everybody. My name is Mika. Um, as Juju mentioned, I do a lot. And it's so funny to hear it said back to you. It's just like, where does all this time come from? Like, who, who is doing this? Um, so I guess to give a little bit of background as well on where I'm coming from, I'm originally from Toronto, Canada. You're going to get the full life story, so I hope everyone is ready for it. Um, We're originally, ready. Great, beautiful. I'm from Toronto, Canada. Grew up, I was in performing arts elementary and high school. I was a drama major, so, you know, theatrical to say the least. Um, my husband would definitely say theatrical. And grew up, you know, living a fairly abnormal life. I, uh, by day, I was like a child actor and in school full time. And by night, my mom and I were fairly housing insecure. And I lived this secret life until I was 18. And when I turned actually 17, I got a summer internship with a woman run marketing company called Pink Mafia, which at the end of the summer turned into like a right hand of the founder position. I ended up working with um, Anna Von Francis, the founder for about four years, everything from running like a 50 girl, to like up to 100 in the summertime guerrilla marketing street team to this is also gonna probably date me a little bit, but this is like what back when blogs made money. So it was like running the blog, we were doing huge corporate events. It was just, it was an amazing experience, especially for, you know, a 17 year old. Like I was a senior in high school when I started doing this work and it was mind boggling. Um, from there I ended up, I actually went to business undergrad for two years and I, I really love school. So I really like the experience. That's all right, that's good. Yeah, but I ended up dropping out. So don't know how <laughs> because I was ready, I was working at a company. I had a very like full life in this role, and I was like, you know what, this is great, but like I don't need it. I will say I learned a lot, like accounting, like fundamentals. Like I, I learned a lot in that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I ended up, I ended up withdrawing, and my whole family had issues with that because education is a very big thing in my family. My grandparents, uh, my mom's parents moved here from the continent, so South mm -hmm. South Africa, like. It during apartheid and West Africa to pursue education. So it was, it was a bit of a, a kerfuffle in the family. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, it balanced out because I was also like had a full-time job that was like very uh, important and exciting for me. I ended up working there for about four years at Pink Mafia, 
starting my own consultancy following that. So doing a lot of the same things, but focused on hospitality and entertainment and millennials before we called ourselves that. So yep. this is like pre avocado toast, like early avocado toast on Buzzfeed days. And <laughs> I loved doing that. I did that for a few years um, and ended up sort of deciding like, you know, I really loved the work but it wasn't fulfilling me in the same way as it used to. And so by that point, I started working a bit more in food justice at the time. I was working as a teaching artist, and then I met my husband. And my husband, Michael, has a background in creative direction. He was in fashion and music at the time, and he was going back and forth to New York. And I was just like, you know, me. he's cute. He wants to leave, he lives in New York half like, what am I doing here? So I ended up like, leaving, we moved to New York full time in 2016. Yeah, and I was just like, you know what, I'm gonna go into education. I was working as a teaching artist. I'd always been really passionate about youth opportunity. And obviously, I, as I mentioned, like education is a very important thing in my family. And so when we moved to New York, I decided, you know, I'm gonna go into arts education. It's what I grew up doing. It's an audience I really, I really understand are young people who love the arts or are interested in them. And so moved to New York, ended up getting into that world. Uh, actually decided to go back to school, finished my undergrad degree at the new school. So I did it. And yeah. I did a self-design degree with the working title, Intersectional Pedagogy Through the Arts and Social Engagement. Mm -hmm. So what that means, yeah, so like, what is that? It is looking at how we gain and impart forms of knowledge, different ways of teaching through intersectional lenses. So race, class, gender, sexuality, right. ability, et cetera. Um, and then on top of that, thinking about how the arts and community organizing impacts that. And I loved that, loved that experience. I went to the new school in Manhattan. And while there, I also ended up um, receiving a fellowship one summer, my first year there, turned into a time role, and I ended up becoming the director of education at this arts organization. And so I was there for two and a half years, running all of their youth programs, really focused on teams that I'm excited about, you know, working with young folks like black black youth, Latinx youth, like just really underserved communities, specifically in East Flatbush, um, who nice. need better opportunities and more support. And loved it so much. Still in touch with a lot of my students. I'm on the advisory board for the organization still. But in parallel to that, my husband and I decided, you know what, we're building all of these ideas together. We've been ideating on tech solutions since we first met in 2015. And we were like, okay, we had this, he pitched me like on our third date about a social platform. So I was like, I like this guy. Like he, Ooh, I like he him like, too. Yes, yes, like, like, right. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and after two years of like talking about ideas, we said, you know what, let's do it. And so we were really lucky to just have like timing wise with me getting a new job, he ended up being able to leave his job and ended up teaching himself to code that year. And so he taught himself to code, built the first app. Yeah, I know, bonkers, built the first app and was video to video. We launched right around the time TikTok started putting like millions of hundreds of millions of dollars into Facebook ads. So we decided, you know what, maybe timing isn't great, but we learned so much from the experience, especially around who our super users were and more importantly, what they wanted. And something we've really noticed and something that we care most about is that for young people, and when I say young people, I mean that very broadly, like you could say Gen Z, you could say young millennial, like however you want to categorize it. Michael and I really focused on self-expression and connection. And how do we create more opportunities for that? And I think that a lot of the tools that we're given, whether that's a social app, whether that's, you know, whatever you want to call in that category, is just like they're not really focused on the people, they're focused on the product. And we're very much the opposite. So Michael's design strategy is very human-centered. He really thinks about building in a really different way. And so we built um, Two Swim out of the learnings from that first product and launched Two Swim the start of this year, so top of 2020. We have an amazing team of humans working with us. Uh, actually, one of our team members, Michael Michael Counter, not my partner and co-founder, Michael, he and I actually met on LinkedIn as well. And hey. now he's like, full, like fully on our team. So LinkedIn has like been a, it's been a good year on LinkedIn. I love um, it. Yeah, but so I guess high level to give folks a, a little bit more to so is really focused on, as you mentioned, like close connections in private communities, but we're also invite only for um, groups, creators and brands that are black, indigenous and POC, LGBTQIA plus or women centric. So really thinking about more nuance of just like actually how do we create safe spaces for these folks? And then of course, allies are allowed to join. But I really think that like allyship, an invitation is also an invitation to really do the work, not yes. just present as an ally. Um, and so that's sort of where we are now. We have a youth program that's wrapping up currently and has been amazing and so much work, but it's been great, uh, called New Community Builders. And we're just, we have a lot, a lot coming up the rest of the year. Honestly, I'm so proud of you. And it's so funny because like I said before, I found you on LinkedIn. I was witnessing your journey. And it's so cool because it's like, as you're filling in the gaps while telling your story on this podcast, 
I feel like I'm starting to even learn way more about you. And that's the reason why these things are so beautiful, right? It's like you're bringing each other together to really get a sense of what's missing in the world and how are each of us actually solving those problems. So I really do want to commend you. What I do want to do, however, is I want to start off by talking about what does it even mean to create a startup, right? Mm -hmm. So you kind of discussed the fact that your partner was kind of, you know, working, doing the creative direction. He stopped it, started coding and created the first product, right? Now, you mentioned particularly about stopping because of timing. What other problems were you experiencing as newfound founders? Mm -hmm. Great question. So I think that something I've learned over my career thus far is that every type of, co there are always similarities, but then there are like vast differences. So going from running my own consultancy for many years in project management events, like all of those things to running a tech startup, or I should say from that to like, having a lot of agency within an arts organization, working mm -hmm. with young people in New York City to starting a tech startup, very different, mm -hmm. very different businesses. I would say skill sets, there's a lot of overlap around like project management, time management, understanding how to hire people and onboard yeah. people. I think that's something that's like probably one of the most key tools is just like, can you read people and understand how to support them? Because I think if you bring right. people on, but you can't support them, what you're not, it doesn't work out in a good way. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that something that I've really learned, some of those difficult, different, more bigger difficulties that came up are around probably understanding funding and how yeah. that works depending on your business model and depending on what industry you're in. I think it's so different even just within like what what's called consumer tech, which is what vertical we work right. in, um, like so different from, you know, a company that creates tools for co other companies, like very right. different. Um, I think the second thing that is something that we, I don't know if I would call it a difficulty that's uh, unique to us. I think it's a difficulty anyone has, but just like figuring out who your user is um, right. and, and also putting into place practices that enable you to do that. And so yeah. what I mean by that is you can, there's a couple different ways. You could throw a bunch of things at the wall, see what sticks, which is like mm -hmm. one model. There's also the model of just like building for a specific person. And so right. for us, our model has been consistently like the people who drive culture are predominantly young people, like black and brown youth, it's predominantly it's queer communities. Like it's like, it's our people. And so that's, we just, we understand it. And that's not to say like everyone else isn't welcome or shouldn't be able to use the tool. It's just like, we know who drives culture. We know who needs these tools and these spaces more. And so that's who we build for. Everyone else will come once they're there. Right. So that's something as well, I think is about thinking about uh, user acquisition or distribution, however you want to word that in mm -hmm. a way that's, that is truly unique. Um, it's something that we spend a lot of time thinking about. So did you actually launch the first product or after the TikTok thing, you just kind of pulled back? What happened? No, we, fully, we were live. So we, we ran it in private beta. So it was like technically mm -hmm. public. Anyone could get an invitation. You just had to like sign up through a sign up form. Um, and right. then we would bring them on and have conversations. So we launched, we were live, and that's kind of actually why Tucson came to be what it was. It was not so much about like TikTok timing that we were just like, we could never compete. It's right. more just, it didn't make sense. And the world didn't seem like that we were in a place for like this type of video. Mm -hmm. app. And I should expand as well, like the app itself. So it was called Waves, we like water references. Uh, so it was video to video, but less about being, um, like making content, which is like anything we've ever built. It's less about content and more about connection. So it was like, Love you do, you, you, you like make a video. Here's an example. You are skateboarding down the street and you like pan from your feet up like around. And I'm like sitting, I don't know, this would be back in the day, but like I'm sitting at like my cast table with my friends, like posting a like, video of like everyone around me. And it's sort of a conversation of video, less about like consumption of content. And so while the product was amazing and like people were loving using it, the timing was confusing for people who are used to the content piece. And so I think that, that that affected it. But for us, it was like, we learned so much about about those folks and how they wanted to connect. And because it was a private beta, it felt like a private social app. And so that's where when we were like, oh, like to swim, like there's a, a clear connection in some of these learnings. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. And then I do want to get a better sense of how similar is your new platform to the old one? So kind of tell mm -hmm. me a little bit about the similarities and the differences. Uh, definitely mostly differences. I would say the biggest similarity mm -hmm. is who our user base is, obviously. Right. So it's not like BIPOC, LGBTQIA+. Um, so user base is similar. 
um, core thesis, the way that Michael and I operate is around like self-expression, creating opportunities, for people to be people on social. I think we spend a lot of time on the media and not on the social. So just like reframing that. Right. Uh, I think another big similarity is that private social network feeling is something yes. we really aim for on Two Swim. And I should say like Two Swim is a community made up of communities. So yes. people join and they're part of a community but you're also part of the larger Two Swim community. And part of that is actually, a big, a big part of that is by design. The whole point is when you come to Two Swim, you should completely change your behavior and how you operate online. So when you go to unnamed mainstream social app, it's a dumpster fire and you act as such because that's how everyone else is acting. On Two Swim, people come here to talk and find their people and like have a good experience. So you're going to continue doing that. And so that's sort of the, the idea behind that. And I love that because I think that our audience are always looking for ways to build more meaningful connections, right? I think that one of the things lacking right now on a lot of social platforms is it's starting to become a space for you to kind of just tell about yourself, but it's less about you actually really getting to know the people who are engaging with your content, right? I think that we have to find boundaries between how much we show of ourselves and how much time we actually invest in you know, giving more time to people who actually want to get to know us because that's mm -hmm. where you create the real relationships. And I can definitely see that Two Swim is fulfilling and bridging that gap. And I love that. Now, what I do want to kind of transition to is team, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like for a lot of people, when they're um, working on startups, for them, it may be just themselves and a partner. And the reality is two people can't do everything for a product, right? Mm -hmm. So I want you to kind of talk about your journey of starting Two Swim now and think about you know who exactly was on your founding team, right? Who were the first few people that you brought on to help you put this together? Absolutely. So, well, my, I, I lucked out because I married my co-founder before right. we was my co-founder. So highly recommend finding your life partner and then starting a company together. I will say the one reason, one of the reasons that Michael and I work so well together is that we have completely complementary skill sets. So Good. he is pure product design and like tech tech building and I am like pure operations people like building partnerships that's my strength so I would say the number one thing is like finding a co-founder who complements your skill sets because yes. um, if you have two people who can do the same thing who's doing everything else exactly it doesn't make sense um so I would say that's a great thought to have um something else so our earliest team member uh was Sanaya Jones who I adore and Sanaya interned with me at the arts organization for a year and then when I left the organization and went full time on Two Swim, she came with me. And so she transitioned into the tech world. And Sanaya's a writer and an artist and just brilliant. And um, so I was able to get Sanaya. I locked her in. We're actually about to have our like two year work anniversary in like two weeks from now. Uh, and she's just the best. So that was something else too. It's just like the people around me, like Sanaya did, had never worked in a tech startup before, but I knew she had skills. I knew she was like willing to figure it out with us. And so, we brought her in because it just made sense. Um, as I mentioned before too, like bringing in Michael Counter, who runs our brand partnerships, Michael and I connected because I posted something on LinkedIn. He comment, commented, it wasn't even a, like, we're, like we weren't connected at that point. And then he right. commented and I looked at him and I was like, this person seems really interesting. Like I started researching, we ended up having a call and we were just like, oh, we are each other's people. Like we need to work together. Yeah. And I think that something you mentioned Juju, which like is crystallizing as we're talking is, I think one of the things about social media and like creators and like how social could be used to build, you know, finding a team is that it's about network versus community. Yes. And so when you think about people as nodes in your network, it's very deep. This is a dramatic term. It's not literally dehumanizing, but it's kind of just like, they're just like boxes to check, not yes. people to check in with. Exactly. And I think that that's something, a really big shift to be made of just like, your team comes from your community. It might be people who you haven't met before, but they become part of your community. And I think that 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 that's a huge difference there on how that how that happened for us. I love that. Oh my god. Honestly, I'm so sunk in because I'm like, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um. So what I also want to talk about is, so I think one of the most, I, th I think the most realistic reason as to why people appreciate or are really big on solopreneurship is because they actually feel like they don't want to deal with people. They actually mm -hmm. don't want the responsibility of leading a team. And I think we all realize that there are beauties and there are cons to being responsible for a group of people, right? Mm -hmm. so what, what, what I want you to talk about is, you know, what are some struggles that a founder can have with their founding team? 
right? And how are you kind of actively always working towards solving those communication or whatever it is type problem? Mm -hmm. So I think the biggest difficulty of having a team, period, is that one, or at least this is my opinion, is like one should be always coaching. Whether yeah. that, you know, doesn't mean that there's people in your team who need coaching. Some people might be able to coach you. So I think it's just this like exchange of understanding that mm -hmm. uh, and really, one can you can only coach someone when you understand yourself or at yeah. least like explain why you're suggesting certain things right. and so i think there's a piece of like personal development that is tied to the professional development of others and so the biggest challenge i would argue is really understanding how you think about things and why you think about things that way so that you can teach them to other people so that they can a have those abilities and then that's fewer decisions that you have to make that they could do on the team's behalf but it also means that when you're giving advice or when you're coaching people on like you know here's how we should manage this new team of interns or how we should think about decision making as a company there's an underlying understanding of the why and at least personally i'm very purpose driven and why driven so yes. that will be my my will always be my answer but i think that explaining that why and under, having an understanding of that for yourself is actually the most difficult piece because you need to be able to teach it to other people Mm -hmm. I love it. Thank you for that. And um, I want to get a better sense of, so for example, I know when people come into a job interview, right? It's like, hey, like what was your biggest failure and how did you kind of overcome it, right? So we're going to get away from the job part, right? We're going to focus more on the business part. I think that something that kind of keeps people from pursuing entrepreneurship or growing their companies is maybe they just keep seeing failures and can't see light at the end, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe kind of bring up what was one of the biggest failures outside of just your product stopping the first time, but what was another big failure that you had to kind of overcome really quickly? Great question. So I would actually challenge that thought. Okay. Juju, not for you, but for people seeing it, because Listen, I don't yes. see the first product not becoming, you know, the next whatever as a failure. Yes. To me, it's an opportunity because it means we learned something. So I think the biggest, the biggest difficulty for someone who sees, who's like sees a lot of failure and gets stressed out or like deterred by that is that the actual thing that needs to be worked on is seeing those failures as opportunities to learn. And I mean, I think that's consistent in the workplace. I think that's consistent in school, like a lot of, in a lot of schooling um, and the way teachers and, and students operate. Um, it's a, it's an opportunity, it's an opportunity. And I think that is a huge, once you understand, once you think about that, you're like, oh, like, right. Like these people, it didn't work out, but like life continued and other things were learned from it. Right. I love that. Thank you for challenging that. I appreciate it. So to my listeners, I hope you heard that. All right. Listen, nothing's really a failure. Just time to adjust. Exactly. That's all it is. Awesome. So we're going to transition a little bit, right? We're going to talk about diversity and inclusion, right? This buzz acronym, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to get a sense of what does diversity and inclusion mean to you? Like, why mm -hmm. is it important if you think it's even important? So I definitely think it's, an, it's important. Right. I also have non-concrete thoughts on the inclusion of the word equity within that. So right. I think that because but then it also gets complicated because pe because people don't know the difference between equity and equality and then it's like mm -hmm. the whole thing um so i think maybe education the e should also be education um but i have a lot of thoughts on it i think it's important obviously obviously I, right yeah, like literally <laughs> living in a body that requires that um i also um, our team talks about this a lot because we are doing the work Yes. So for us, it's not even a conversation of, you know, how do we make our team more diverse? It's mm -hmm. more a conversation of how do we make sure our communities are thinking about inclusion? And so I think that diversity of thought, diversity of demographic, diversity of life experience, et cetera, is very important. I think the without the inclusion part, there is no point of the diversity because you have a bunch of people who have very different views potentially in a room with no sense of like, all belonging and right. i think that a community is like very much great it's rooted in belonging and trust and so without that you kind of just have a, a you checked a bunch of boxes but no one feels like a like a person um exactly. yeah so those are my, that's my thought on that love it and i actually want to take a little throwback right mm -hmm. so for example the reason why i presented that question is because i think you are the epitome of diversity and inclusion i think that everything yeah. about what you're doing now and everything that you've explained that you've done in the past is completely representative of this theme, right? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned about your parents being from South Africa, right? And kind of experiencing some things down there, right? Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about what have they taught you or rooted in you so that you know 
what your purpose needs to be in life? Like how mm -hmm. has that influenced your decisions? Mm -hmm. So great question. So it's funny. So my, it was my grandparents who were from. Grandparents, excuse me. That. Yeah. But that's actually a, a thing that is very important to me to distinguish. There's an activity that I've done actually in a lot of like professional development DNI workshops where you like map out your life story and it's like the right. highs and the peaks and the lows. I don't know if you've done that. And every time I do it, I started at my grandparents coming to Canada, which most people started, you know, I was born and mine is like, you know, 50 years before I was alive. Mm -hmm. And because I think it's really important to recognize that. And so I think something I spend a lot of time and Juju, I might go tangential. So if I do just bring it okay. back. No, it's um, okay. Okay, cool. So let's do it. So I think something I think a lot about is legacy. Yes. And legacy as different as a member of different groups of demographics, legacy as someone who's building in tech who isn't the like, you know, traditional tech CEO person. Right. Um, I think about legacy for like young people and the birth that we live on. And like have always been deeply concerned about climate change since I was a child. And so to me, it's like, I think I spend a lot of time thinking about legacy. And so for me, that is why something like DNI, for example, is just so like naturally part of how I operate is because mm -hmm. it's it's always been how I've been. So like, even as an example, when I was in high school, I was the kid who sat at all of everyone's lunch tables. I didn't have like one friend group. I was part of every friend group. Mm -hmm. And I think that that also has given me a really different perspective on thinking about diversity and inclusion because yeah. I also, then that means that like all of the birthday parties I had, had a bunch of random people who never hung out with each other at the party. And it was like my job to make them all be friends. And so for me, it's like that has been rooted in my life because that has been how my whole family has, that's how I was raised. That's how I've always operated. It's just like, we should have diversity, but everyone belongs because they're there. Like there's no reason, there's no reason not to center that in the work. I love it. And honestly, that wasn't a tangent. That was actually on brand. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. <laughs> Good. Awesome. And do you feel like there were any very specific lessons that maybe your grandparents learned while in South Africa that they told you, listen, take this with you, whatever this quote is, and live by it, breathe it? Like, is that a thing? Mm -hmm. I don't know that there was ever a specific quote, mm -hmm. but something I will say something I've been, I'll just say something that I'm thinking about a lot lately in relation mm -hmm. to my, my grandmother specifically. So my mom's mom, my gogi grew up in South Africa during apartheid. Like mm -hmm. she's been a, like a rights, human rights advocate and women's rights advocate for, she's for like 60 years now. She's spoken at the UN like at multiple years for like most of that time. She's retired now. Um, and she grew up in the Mandela, like she went to high school with those, like they all lived, she grew up in that world. That was right. her, that was her life. Um, and so something that's been really, I remember her telling me stories like as a little kid about how her mother was an entrepreneur and her parents as like black people in apartheid had like multiple businesses. They knit sweaters for people who played tennis. They had a restaurant. They, she was a teacher. She also actually mentored young women who were trying to be entrepreneurs at that time. And my googie used to tell me these stories as a kid. And I was like, it was little, so I wasn't really like computing it. And then, you know, growing up with my grandmother, she's just like a powerhouse. She used to be like, she goes to the UN every year and she like had a store and she's like a, 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 a women's rights advocate within the, in Canada as well. She lives in Winnipeg. And so talking to my googie about understanding this idea of you can't be what you can't see, which I right. think we hear this saying a lot now more recently. And I'm not sure like where, where this started popping up, which I think it's important to talk about, but mm -hmm. something I'm thinking a lot about, again, that legacy piece is if you can't be what you can't see, but there is no one around you doing it, you have to see yourself in that place yes. or else it, you won't make it there. Or else it'll be, at least very least, it'll be like really difficult and a slog to get to that point. So if you can't be what you can't see, you have to see yourself in that role. Um, oh, I think, somebody, oh, go ahead, keep going. No, I'm just gonna say that's something I'm spending a lot of time thinking about lately. And I kind of like how you mentioned that because it brings me back to the thought about when people say, if you don't write it down, it's not reality. So are you also mm -hmm. a believer in that, that you should draw out or write out what you want to be or what kind oh, of you want to achieve? Yeah. yeah. I don't know if we've talked about this. I'm like a huge life organizer. Mm -hmm. person. Yeah. So if I think I sent it to you already, but folks can go to my website. There's actually like a link called how to organize your life. I did a webinar on it in June and back in June. So there's like a whole walkthrough of my strategy. And then I shared, I have like a home base. I save, my like five, two year, five year goals, my like 60 year out goals, all of that. So yeah, 
It's yeah. important. Yeah. This is why we're here together. We're like exactly. this. <laughs> Honestly, exactly. we're on the same wavelength. Exactly. Um, we'll start wrapping up soon. So to my listeners, I hope you all have been grasping a lot of this information. Um, we're actually going to start talking a little bit more about future trends in technology, right? I think that what people are starting to realize is that tech isn't necessarily just an industry anymore. It's mm -hmm. kind of becoming this thing that you just need to infuse in every industry that you're trying to get into, right? Mm -hmm. For you, for example, you were education first. Yes. And, and technology became this thing that you wanted to use or create to solve problems and educating people on how to better connect with each other and better understand or learn their experiences, right? Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about for someone who wants to be a tech founder, what should they be studying, thinking about? Like what should be in their heads? Great question. So I think, so this will be infused by my personal interest. So definitely as a tech founder who has a background in arts education, my biggest passion is gen is like Gen Z and younger generations and how they live and making like their lives great. So. Mm -hmm. Maybe by example, I can say the answer is like, find your focus and then like figure it all out. So mm -hmm. I spend a ton of time, like almost every day talking to teenagers about what they what they want to do in life in, through technology, how they want to create and find their, find their people. So I think like find your thing and then don't get out of it until you have a full understanding of it. Um, I think getting into tech is again, like an iterative process. So getting in might be teaching yourself to code and like being part of tech tech Twitter community and like talking mm -hmm. to people. Being in tech might be getting a job, working, you know, doing something like chief of staff at a tech company. Like there's all kinds of roles within tech, I think as well, as you alluded, like you mentioned at the start, it's like, we don't even know what, there's so many jobs that are yes. created within technology that mm -hmm. don't require you to know how to code, that don't require some of those more technical skills for folks who aren't interested or, or don't have them. And so I think the biggest thing is like, figure out what you're really passionate about and then find the job, whatever that might be. Whether it's like marketing at a FinTech company because you're really passionate about the unbanked, whether it's, you know, building products like I am focused on Gen Z to create and express themselves. Like whatever that thing is you're really passionate about, just like find the skills you have and then make that happen. Yes, and it's so funny you mentioned that because even with Melinda Vision, we're focusing on transitioning into this digital media presence, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was in high school and college, people would always say, hey, what do you want to be? Like, what do you want to do, Juju? I'm like, yeah, I want to be a doctor, you know? They're like, you want to be a doctor? I'm like, yeah, am I dumb to you? They're like, I, I have 90 averages too. They're like, mm -hmm. no, I think you're smart, but your personality gives me media vibes. Like, I can see you being in Oprah C or maybe yeah. it's a Dr. Oz or something. And for me, yeah. I just really never envisioned this whole media thing, right? But I think the reality is when you get a sense of what you're interested in, what you're good at, what you want to talk about, you start to find yourself in new spaces that you've never actually seen yourself in before. And mm -hmm. I think that's why it's so important to understand tech because it's actually getting into all of those different industries. It's getting into the media. It's getting into healthcare. It's getting into finance, like you just mentioned, right? It's all about thinking about what you're passionate about, how you want to execute on that, and just find the right company and position that lets you fulfill it. And I think exactly. you aced that in your response, literally aced it. I think one thing as well that you made me think of just now, Juju, is the mm -hmm. idea of, well, what if I don't know what I want to do? Because that's right. the next, that's like the other question. It's like, well, I, right. I don't know what I want to do. I just know that this is like a space I should probably be looking at. Me, and me. Exactly. And I transitioned. So I went from working in arts education. I knew not a single thing about tech. I wasn't in tech. I didn't know anyone in tech. And so, you know, mm -hmm. it's a lot of Googling. Yep. At the time, it was going to a lot of events in person. Now they're all digital. And that's kind of actually better because you have access to like way more things around the world that you wouldn't necessarily. Um, and so I think the biggest thing is when you don't, when the answer is what I don't know what I want to do, then the answer is go find out. And that's like, okay, creating again, like I'm very regimented. So I'm like, okay, make a schedule. Like every day you're going to go to one event that's totally different within the tech world and figure out like who's doing what, what gets you excited and interested. Email that person and say, hey, I just watched this thing. I thought these three things were interesting. Would you give me 15 minutes to talk? Mm -hmm. The worst thing that happens is they don't respond because they're so busy. Mm -hmm. If you make a personal appeal to someone, even if they've never met you, their high likelihood of them replying is, is very high. Yep. Thank you. Talk about it. Awesome. All right, Mika. So I have one final question for you. Okay. Just 
one thing that has been consistent throughout this entire conversation and just in terms of me acknowledging your brand once again you are not tech first you're something else first tech is the tool right mm -hmm. i want you to talk about what does the future of education look like mm -hmm. for anybody who's just saying you know what i need to get into this space i don't know what it takes i don't know how to do it i don't know what it's going to look like 10 years from now but i need to be here what mm -hmm. does the future of education look like i think that the future hmm. I think that the future of, I'm gonna cheat on your answer. I'm gonna pull oh, three, I'm pulling three industries together because I don't, I see myself working at so many intersections that it's hard for yes. me to say one. Cause if you say education, no, then I'm like, I'll go left. So I think the future of this, the future of like digital conversation and yes. interaction looks like new opportunities and for new voices to be heard. And yes. I think that's consistent across the users of these these tools. I think that's consistent across the people making them and building them. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's consistent across like what, how they evolve. And so when you look at how platforms have typically, like tech platforms that are sort of like mainstream, you like consumer oriented, usually evolve based on like the people building it, deciding what happens. And I mm -hmm. think create like a collaborative creative process is really, really integral for the future to be different than what it has been so far. Yes, honestly, snap snaps to that. Is there any last words that you wanna share with our audience today? Just that I love meeting new people. So if anyone ever wants to reach out, you just need to send a, a personalized message. You'll get That's it. So fun. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody. And there you all have it. Once again, thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, I think it's obvious that Mika has dropped a lot of essential gems on us, right? Not only in terms of being a founder and having her own startup, but just in terms of life, right? And getting a better sense of how do you dissect the opportunity of turning something you love and have always cared about into something that can either provide you with the life that you love and you're satisfied with, or it's either changing other people's lives and you're very happy and comfortable with that as well. All right, you all, so start getting innovative. Don't, don't be fearful of taking on that new goal, that new dream, whatever it is, just get on it, y'all, okay? So with that being said, I will see you all on the next episode. And thank you so much, Tamika, for tuning in with us today. Bye, everyone.